Chapter Two of Sylvie and Bruno. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claire Goget. Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. Chapter Two L'Ami Inconnu. As we entered the breakfast saloon, the professor was saying, and he had breakfast by himself early, so he begged you wouldn't wait for him, my lady. This way, my lady, he added, this way, and then, with, as it seemed to me, most superfluous politeness, he flung open the door of my compartment and ushered in. A young and lovely lady, I muttered to myself with some bitterness. And this is, of course, the opening scene of volume one. She is the heroine, and I am one of those subordinate characters that only turn up when needed for the development of her destiny, and whose final appearance is outside the church waiting to greet the happy pair. Yes, my lady, change at Fayfield, were the next words I heard. Oh, that too obsequious guard. Next station but one. And the door closed, and the lady settled down into her corner, and the monotonous throb of the engine, making one feel as if the train were some gigantic monster, whose very circulation we could feel, proclaimed that we were once more speeding on our way. The lady had a perfectly formed nose, I caught myself saying to myself, hazel eyes and lips. And here it occurred to me, to see for myself what the lady was really like, would be more satisfactory than much speculation. I looked round cautiously, and was entirely disappointed of my hope. The veil which shrouded her whole face was too thick for me to see more than the glitter of bright eyes, and the hazy outline of what might be a lovely oval face, but might also unfortunately be an equally unlovely one. I closed my eyes again, saying to myself, "'Couldn't have a better chance for an experiment in telepathy. I'll think out her face, and afterwards test the portrait with the original.' At first no result at all crowned my efforts though I divided my swift mind, now hither, now thither, in a way that I felt sure would have made Aeneas green with envy. But the dimly seen oval remained as provokingly blank as ever, a mere ellipse, as if in some mathematical diagram, without even the foci that might be made to do duty as a nose and a mouth. Gradually, however, the conviction came upon me that I could, by a certain concentration of thought, think the veil away, and so get a glimpse of the mysterious face as to which the two questions, is she pretty and is she plain, still hung suspended in my mind in beautiful equipoise. Success was partial, and fitful, still there was a result. Ever and anon the veil seemed to vanish in a sudden flash of light, but before I could fully realize the face, all was dark again, and each such glimpse the face seemed to grow more childish and more innocent, and when I had at last thought the veil entirely away, it was unmistakably the sweet face of little Sylvie. So either I have been dreaming about Sylvie, I said to myself, and this is the reality, or else I've really been with Sylvie, and this is a dream. Is life itself a dream, I wonder? To occupy the time, I got out the letter which had caused me to take this sudden railway journey from my London home down to a strange fishing town on the north coast, and read it over again. Dear old friend, I'm sure it will be as great a pleasure to me as it can possibly be to you, to meet once more after so many years, and of course I shall be ready to give you all the benefit of such medical skill as I have, only you know one mustn't violate professional etiquette and you are already in the hands of a first-rate london doctor with whom it would be utter affection for me to pretend to compete i make no doubt he is right in saying the heart is affected all your symptoms point that way one thing at any rate i have already done is my doctorial capacity secured you a bedroom on the ground floor so that you will not need to ascend the stairs at all i shall expect you by last train on friday in accordance with your letter and till then i shall say in the words of the old song oh for friday niche friday's lang a comin yours always arthur forrester p s do you believe in fate this postscript puzzled me sorely he is far too sensible a man i thought to have become a fatalist and yet what else can he mean by it and as i folded up the letter and put it away i inadvertently repeated the words aloud do you believe in fate the fair incognita turned her head quickly at the sudden question. "'No, I don't,' she said with a smile. "'Do you?' "'I—I I didn't mean to ask the question,' I stammered. A little taken aback at having begun a conversation in so unconventional a fashion. 
the lady's smile became a laugh not a mocking laugh but the laugh of a happy child who is perfectly at her ease didn't you she said then it was a case of what you doctors call unconscious cerebration i am no doctor i replied do i look so like one or what makes you think it she pointed to the book i had been reading which was so lying that its title diseases of the heart was plainly visible one needn't be a doctor i said to take an interest in medical books there's another class of readers who are yet more deeply interested you mean the patients she interrupted while a look of tender pity gave new sweetness to her face but with an evident wish to avoid a possibly painful topic one needn't be either to take an interest in books of science which contain the greatest amounts of science do you think the books or the minds rather a profound question for a lady i said to myself holding with her the conceit so natural to a man that woman's intellect is essentially shallow and i considered a minute before replying if you mean living minds i don't think it's possible to decide there's so much written science that no living person has ever read and there's so much thought-out science that hasn't yet been written but if you mean the whole human race then i think the minds have it everything recorded in books must have been written in some mind you know isn't that rather like one of the rules in algebra my lady inquired algebra too i thought with increasing wonder i mean if we consider thoughts as factors may we not say that the least common multiple of all the minds contains that of all the books but not the other way certainly we may i replied delighted with the illustration and what a grand thing it would be i went on dreamily thinking aloud rather than talking if we could only apply that rule to books you know in finding the least common multiple we strike out a quantity wherever it occurs except in the term where it is raised to its highest power so we should have to erase every recorded thought except in the sentence where it is expressed with the greatest intensity my lady laughed merrily some books would be reduced to blank paper i'm afraid she said they would most libraries would be terribly diminished in bulk but just think what they would gain in quality when will it be done she eagerly asked if there's any chance of it in my time i think i'll leave off reading and wait for it well perhaps in another thousand years or so then there's no use waiting said my lady let's sit down i'll gug my pet come and sit by me anywhere but by me growled the sub-warden the little wretch always manages to upset his coffee i guessed at once as perhaps the reader will also have guessed if like myself he is very clever at drawing conclusions that my lady was the sub-warden's wife and that uggug a hideous fat boy about the same age as sylvie with the expression of a prize pig was their son sylvie and bruno with the lord chancellor made up a party of seven and you actually got a plunge bath every morning said the sub-warden seemingly in continuation of a conversation with the professor even at the little roadside inns oh certainly certainly the professor replied with a smile on his jolly face allow me to explain it is in fact a very simple problem in hydrodynamics that means a combination of water and strength if we take a plunge bath and a man of great strength such as myself about to plunge into it we have a perfect example of the science i am bound to admit the professor continued in a lower tone and with downcast eyes that we need a man of remarkable strength he must be able to spring from the floor to about twice his own height, gradually turning over as he rises, so as to come down again head first. "'Why, you need a flea, not a man!' exclaimed the sub-warden. "'Pardon me,' said the professor. "'This particular kind of bath is not adapted for a flea, let us suppose,' he continued, folding his table-napkin into a graceful festoon, "'that this represents what is perhaps the necessity of this age, the active tourist's portable bath.' you may describe it briefly if you like looking at the chancellor by the letters a t p b the chancellor much disconcerted at finding everybody looking at him could only murmur in a shy whisper precisely so one great advantage of this plunge bath continued the professor is that it requires only half a gallon of water i don't call it a plunge bath his sub excellency remarked unless your active tourist goes right under but he does go right under the old man gently replied the a t hangs up the p b on a nail thus he then empties the water jug into it places the empty jug below the bag leaps into the air descends head first into the bag the water rises round him to the top of the bag and there you are he triumphantly concluded the a t is as much under water as if he'd gone a mile or two down into the atlantic 
and he's drowned, let us say, in about four minutes. By no means, the professor answered with a proud smile. After about a minute, he quietly turns a tap at the lower end of the PB. All the water runs back into the jug, and there you are again. But how in the world is he to get out of the bag again? That, I take it, said the professor, is the most beautiful part of the whole invention. All the way up the PB inside are loops for the thumbs, so it's something like going upstairs, only perhaps less comfortable, and by the time the AT has risen out of the bag, all but his head he's sure to topple over, one way or the other. The law of gravity secures that. And there he is on the floor again. A little bruised, perhaps? Well, yes, a little bruised, but having had his plunge bath, that's the great thing. "'Wonderful! It's almost beyond belief,' murmured the sub-warden. The professor took it as a compliment, and bowed with a gratified smile. "'Quite beyond belief,' my lady added, meaning no doubt to be more complimentary still. The professor bowed, but he didn't smile this time. "'I can assure you,' he said earnestly, "'that provided the bath was made, I used it every morning. I certainly ordered it, that I am clear about. My only doubt is whether the man ever finished making it. It's difficult to remember after so many years.' At this moment the door, very slowly and creakingly, began to open, and Sylvie and Bruno jumped up and ran to meet the well-known footsteps. End of chapter 2 L'Ami Inconnu Recording by Claire Gauget